Good morning, everybody. Looks like we've got everybody joined. All right, well, good morning and welcome to Veggie Basics. This season, or this season, this presentation by Margaret Pickoff is gonna focus on harvesting and end of season tasks. This is being recorded and you will receive a copy of this recording um, once, once um, that's been edited after, after it has ended. So thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Meredith Melendez and I'm the County Agricultural Agent from Mercer County with Rutgers Cooperative Extension. For those of you who maybe haven't participated in extension programming in the past, Cooperative Extension is part of our land-grant university, Rutgers University, and we have offices in every county in the state. And most of those counties have master gardener programs, uh, which are part of agricultural and natural resources, which is my department within Extension. Um, and the master gardener program is a, a training program for volunteers that, that then answer questions from the public about lawn and garden topics. Extension is also home to our 4-H program um, and family and consumer health sciences educators. Rutgers has extensive information available online for the public focusing on home lawn and gardens. You can see the website below and the different topics that are covered. We have many publications that are produced and updated on a regular basis. And most of these publications are created based on the questions that our Master Gardener volunteers answer um, during Helpline at each of the extension offices. We also have the Master Gardener website with information that's specific for Master or Mercer County residents, but is also applicable to those outside of the county. You can find this website at mgofmc.org. The Master Gardener Helpline is open Tuesdays and Thursdays from 12 to 3 currently at the Mercer County Extension Office. You can leave a message uh, at other times or talk to a Master Gardener at 609-989-6853. And we now have an email address that goes right to our helpline where you can email questions into the Master Gardeners. That's askthemgs at mercercounty.org. What's important to note is that a master gardener will not be emailing you back. They'll be calling you back. So please, if you send in a question to that email address, please include your phone number. It's always helpful to get a lot of information about the, the question that you have, as well as any pictures that you might be able to attach to, uh, to that email. Um, and so this is, this is our debut of advertising that email address. Um, and so far we have actually been getting a lot of questions via phone where people have been sending in things that's been working very nicely for, for our volunteers. So next, I'm going to turn this over to Anvario, who is chair of our community education committee for the Master Gardeners and a trained Master Gardener, uh, an important part of the program. And thank you, Anne, for, for pulling all of these things together for us. It's great that we've been able to continue to do outreach through the pandemic. Uh, stay relevant to everyone and, and engage with the public. So thank you, Anne. Okay, thank you, Meredith. <laughs> it's been great to have your support and uh, Margaret's support in order to be able to do programs through the pandemic. We've really uh, learned a lot about virtual uh, programming, not everything, but um, we are learning. As uh, Meredith said, my name is Anne Varia, my, and I'm a co-chair with Kathleen Urwitt of the Community Education Committee. We've had a full year and a half of programs and hope you've been able to join us for some of them. Um, as a registration, a registrant for this program, you'll automatically be added to our email list and will receive information about upcoming programs. After today's program, our next program will be an in-person, our first compost demonstration program at our Mercer Education Gardens on Federal City Road on Saturday, September 25th at 10 a.m. 
attendance will be quite limited and we will be sending out registration information soon. And we're certainly hoping that we'll be able to ha have this because we're all working hard to get the gardens in shape so that to welcome you all. And on October 12th, we'll be offering a virtual program by noted native plant landscape designer, Larry Wiener. And look for our email about the program and registration that we send usually out about a few weeks ahead of time. Today's program is the last in our 2021 three-part Veggie Basics series presented by Margaret Pickoff. At the time of the first two programs, Margaret was Mercer County Horticulturalist and our MG coordinator. Since then, she has left to take a new job as extension educator in the Bucks County Office of the Penn State Extension Service. Of course, Mercer County's loss is definitely Bucks County's gain. We miss her, but we are delighted that she is returning today as a guest presenter. Margaret has a special interest in vegetables and cut flowers and holds a Master of Science degree in plant, soil, and environmental sciences from the University of Maine, specializing in organic crop production and soil fertility. You are, uh, should feel free to submit any questions via the chat. We will be reviewing them and we'll share them um, with Margaret uh, several times during the presentation at logical stopping points and definitely at the end. Take it away, Margaret, thank you. Thank you, Anne, and thanks, Meredith. I'm gonna share my screen. And, and does that look all right? Yep, looks okay to me. Okay, wonderful. Um, okay, well, thank you so much for the intro, Anne. I'm so happy to be here uh, on this kind of gray morning, um, kind of reminiscent of fall. Uh, uh, so it's kind of, it's a good time to be talking about the end of the season. Um, I, uh, as Anne mentioned, I've, I've given a couple of these programs before. Uh, we've tried to sort of time them at various points in the vegetable growing season um, to help you along uh, with, with spring tasks and planting and maintenance in the summer. And then this is kind of a final of those three, focusing on harvesting and end of season tasks. Um, Vegetable gardening is uh, such a wide field. There is so much to know. Uh, there are so many different crops you can experiment with. And so we absolutely won't cover everything today, but hopefully this gives you a little primer if you are a beginner. Um, all right. Okay, so I hate to start with bad news. Uh, and it's hard to believe because we've been having temperatures in the 90s so often this summer. Um, but our frost free season is coming to a close. Uh, whether you are a summer person or you can't wait for summer to be over, uh, if you're a veggie gardener, you probably do like the summer season. But I'm here to break the news that it's not going to last forever. Um, you may have already seen some decline on some of your plants, um, and it's time to start thinking ahead to when it gets a whole lot colder. So, this is some information I pulled for the Trenton region from NOAA's National Centers for Environmental Information. Um, and uh, this is basically our, our average growing season for this region. Um, and I've, I've broken it down by uh, the probability that we will uh, experience a uh, some temperatures below 32 degrees, below 28 degrees, and below 24 degrees. So. Um, usually when we're talking about veggies and the end of the season, some vegetables can tolerate some light frost. So even temps in the 32 degree range are not going to kill off everything in your vegetable garden. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But what I'll be focused on is this kind of uh, middle value here, uh, where it is more than likely that we will hit 28 degrees or lower. Uh, and that's by October 25th. Um, so basically from today, we have about 58 days left of our average vegetable growing season. 
And I just wanted to point out, uh, as Anne mentioned, I, I have, uh, I have uh, recently left Rutgers Cooperative Extension and moved over to Penn State Extension, but um, Rutgers has amazing resources and I know that firsthand. So for New Jersey growers, I did want to point out that if you're new to New Jersey or even if you're just new to gardening, um, Rutgers keeps really detailed uh, climate information about, uh, about the state uh, based on historical records. Um, you can go to weatherobs.rutgers.edu and just look around and you're able to see at what point in the season does the temperature usually dip below this temperature? Um, you know, how about how much longer can I plan uh, to be growing things? When should I really look to uh, to wrap things up? And similarly, on the other end of the growing season next spring, um, when should I be ramping up to start my veggie uh, garden? So uh, that's a great resource. I it takes a little bit of time to kind of get used to the graphs and everything, but it's a really, um, that's a good tool to have in your pocket as a New Jersey gardener. So we're gonna be talking about late season tests. Um, and again, some of these might feel a little premature, maybe you're still totally enjoying the abundance of uh, your garden and your harvest is off the charts. You're really enjoying bringing in your tomatoes and your beans and everything. But um, again, it's time to start looking ahead. So this is a good time of year to pull any crops that are no longer producing, or maybe they've had some disease issues throughout the season, or they've been highly damaged by pest insects. It's also a good time to think about planting a fall garden if you haven't already. So uh, we'll be talking about crops that are tolerant of cooler temperatures that you can actually plant now um, and, and have some, some food to harvest throughout the fall season and sometimes into the winter. Um, you'll be looking at harvesting your late summer crops at this point. Um, I know my tomatoes have really slowed down in the last couple of weeks. Um, you might want to think about establishing cover crops. If you've never done that before, that's a great way to condition your soil. Um, caring for your soil in general, the fall is a really good time to do that because as you probably know, spring is a super busy season in the garden. So whatever you can do now in the fall to get ahead of that uh, will benefit you later. Um, and I also want to remind you, and this should probably be a part of every Veggie Basics class, but keep a record of your successes and challenges throughout the season. That's going to help you a lot in the years to come. So that's actually where we'll start. And this isn't the best photo. Um, I've been trying to update my, my PowerPoints to include more photos that I've taken rather than random photos from the internet um, because it's a little easier and maybe easier to demonstrate what I'm talking about. But um, this is a big map of a large vegetable garden that I helped to manage um, back in 2015 uh, out in Washington. Washington State. And this is probably larger than most of your home gardens. This is about an acre and a half of growing space. Um, but we did a really meticulous job of recording everything that we grew in every bed uh, for at least the last five years. Um, so the crop, the variety, and we also took notes about how it did, whether we noticed uh, major pest issues uh, or disease issues. Um, this is really crucial information for the future uh, when you're uh, planning to rotate your crops, so changing the location that you plant things so that pests and diseases don't get used to that plant being there year after year. Um, and it's also just a nice record of, of your growing season. It's a great way to learn and to encourage yourself to, to sort of look things up. Um, identify things that you have found and take more of, a, of an interest in the maybe some of the issues that you're seeing and some of the successes. So if you've had a, a bounty and, and have had a lot of success with this one type of, um, you know, green bean variety, then you'll probably want to grow that in future years. So it's good to take note of that. So that's just a little reminder that even though the season is wrapping up, this is a really good time to take stock of your garden and, and record um, what's been going on. 
So remove crops that are diseased, damaged, or no longer producing. So this is a great time of season to sort of you're, you're, you're given permission to just give up on the stuff that's really not working for you. If you've been trying to grow that beautiful heirloom tomato and it's just struggling through the season, just pull it out at this point in the season. If you've got crops like lettuce on the right-hand side that have bolted and they're going to seed, um, unless you're planning to collect that seed, um, I'd pull those out too because that lettuce is getting really bitter. It's not gonna be very good to harvest um, this person seems to be uh, growing cilantro, which is notorious for bolting or going to seed, uh, basically sending up a flower shoot um, at the first sign of really hot weather. So unless you're trying to uh, collect that seed as coriander or you just think they're pretty, uh, feel free to pull those things out at this point. Um, anything that's not showing signs of disease or has a lot of pest damage on it, you can throw that right in the compost pile. Um, it's gonna free up space in the garden so that you can focus on growing fall crops or, uh, or cover crops. Um, and also it's gonna increase air circulation at a point in the season where we do have a lot of moisture in the air and there, there might be some more disease issues. So, um, so feel free to give up on stuff that's not working. It's late enough in the season now, so you can focus on the things that are working. Um, so just again, in terms of taking stock of what's going on in the garden, look for signs of distress on your plants. Um, th this is a photo that I took uh, at a community garden, um, and I, I have not sent these you know, samples into our, a disease clinic or anything. So I, I don't know exactly what's happening here. It could be bacterial leaf disease. It could be something physiological happening. Um, but again, take note of what's going on. If it seems like the crop has stopped producing a whole lot, um, just you're, you're welcome to just pull it out. Uh, tomatoes are starting to look pretty gross at this time of season. Um, I, you know, again, it's a matter of whether you're seeing some really intense disease issues. Uh, again, I don't, I don't particularly know exactly what's going on with this tomato plant. Um, uh, tomatoes have a lot of disease issues, a lot of pest issues. Um, I would focus on if there's no really uh, highly discernible disease that you're seeing that would make you want to get that out of there immediately um, focus on the harvest. So are you still harvesting um, good tomato fruits from this plant? If not, um, this is a great time to, to uh, get that out of the garden. Um, just a note that when I was learning to vegetable garden, the person that I was learning most closely uh, from um, told me never to compost tomato plant tissue uh, just because tomatoes have so many disease issues. Um, this is kind of a matter of personal preference. I've tried to find extension, the, a firm extension, uh, you know, dis decision one way or the other on this, and, and it seems like uh, kind of six to one, half a dozen to the other. But um, if, you, if you are noticing disease on your tomato plant, um, you might consider burying it or putting it uh, in a trash bag or something like that, rather than putting it in your compost pile. Um, powdery mildew is one that we see a lot at this time of year. If you are growing a lot of things in the squash and pumpkin and cucumber family, you probably see this kind of uh, white powdery substance on the leaves. Um, this is kind of ubiquitous in, in vegetable gardens, especially late in the season. Uh, it is a fungal pathogen. Um, it occasionally will get bad enough that it will affect the crop uh, yield or quality, but usually it pops up at the end of the season when you're already almost ready to harvest uh, your squash uh, or whatever it is. And so it doesn't really make a lot of sense to try to control it at that point. So it, it's in the garden. I think those spores spread through air currents. And so if your neighbor has, has some powdery mildew, you'll probably get it as well. Um, again, I probably would just put this in the compost pile, um, but some gardeners will tell you not to, uh, to try to limit the amount of those fungal spores um, in your garden system. 
So if it's highly diseased, you might again consider putting it in a trash bag, throwing it away rather than composting it. There are some diseases that you should watch out for in the garden um, that tend to have kind of a cyclic nature to them maybe. So uh, we do have years where late blight is really, really bad in New Jersey. Um, and, and, and this is one that can kill tomato plants very quickly. And so if you're seeing symptoms like these on the leaves and fruits of the tomato, um, it's a good idea to get that diagnosed by talking to uh, your local master gardeners. Um, if you have any questions about whether you're, you're pretty sure it might be late blight, uh, you know it's a bad season for late blight, don't take any chances and just pull out that plant uh, again, put it in a trash bag and throw it away. That is something you do not want spreading around your garden uh, ecosystem. Uh, some other ones, if you grow a lot of garlic, you're probably aware of white rot. Um, this is a really destructive um, pathogen as well that can actually stay in the soil for between 20 and 40 years. Um, and so this is another one to watch out for that is really serious. Um, again, I, I haven't heard much about this in this season, but if it kind of strikes your garden, then you're not able to grow anything in the garlic and onion family in that soil for quite a long time. Club root disease is another one that can stay in the soil for uh, pretty much indefinitely. Um, and so this is, this is uh, kind of characteristic of club root disease where um, plants in the cabbage and broccoli family will kind of start to yellow and wilt. And then when you pull them out of the ground, you see these sort of deformed roots here. They're kind of, um, uh, well, you can tell how it gets its name. This is another one, you know, so, so just be aware that there are some serious vegetable diseases out there. It's a good idea if you have crops that you like to grow every year, um, it is a really good idea to read up on them and see what the typical uh, diseases are that that crop gets, some control mechanisms, know how to recognize it soon so you can get those plants out of there. And I don't mean to scare you with all of this talk about, you know, stuff being in your soil forever, but um, if you have question, if you're questioning in your head whether something is a serious disease or not, just treat it like it is um, and, and throw that plant tissue away um, rather than putting it in your compost pile. Um, this is also a good time of year to evaluate your pest pressure in your vegetable garden. Um, again, so if there are crops that you love to grow, it makes a lot of sense for you to get to know what their typical enemies are. So what are the insects that are generally going to come in uh, and try to, try to eat those plants? Um, imported cabbage worm is one we see a lot that cause these sort of ragged holes in the leaves of cabbage and kale, um, anything in the brassica family. Um, uh, th these are all pests, ones that I'm going to show you. A lot of garden pests will overwinter in crop debris and leaf litter. Um, that's not always something you can manage, uh, but you can remove crop debris from your vegetable garden at the end of the season. Um, crop rotation is also helpful, so you're not growing the same crop family over and over and over in the same spot, and basically giving those pest insects a free lunch every season. So that's imported cabbage worm. You may have seen striped cucumber beetles um, this season. They create this uh, their, their larva will feed on roots of, uh, in the cucumber family. That usually doesn't do that much damage, but you'll see these little yellow beetles eating the leaves. Um, so that's what that is. Wireworm will cause things like lettuce to just wilt, and then you pull it out and you see that there's a little wiry worm feeding at the roots. Squash vine borer, so if you grow a lot of squash, uh, sometimes they will just wilt uh, seemingly overnight, and, and oftentimes this is the culprit. Uh, so this little, um, this, uh, the, uh, the adult will lay their eggs at the base of squash 
um, and pumpkin uh, plants. And then the larva will sort of bore into the stem. And you can see him peeking his little head out there. Uh, that basically inhibits water flow uh, from, the, from the roots getting to the leaves. And so everything will wilt. Uh, sometimes you can see the little entry hole, or if you cut open the stem, you can find the larva in there. So just some pest insects to be aware of. Um, you know, we don't have time to go through all of them. Uh, I don't know every single detail of, of all of these, but um, if you are a vegetable gardener and you'd like to be serious about it, it makes sense to know what sort of pest insects are in your garden um, and what you're having the most trouble with. Uh, similarly, Colorado potato beetle will feed on potatoes uh, tomatoes. Um, you'll see their their orange le uh, eggs at the um, backside of your of your leaves, and flea beetles, which cause these little pinholes um, in a lot of different types of crops. Um, so basic, basically, the the what I'm recommending is take note of what you're seeing, um, get things diagnosed if you can. So bringing samples to your local map. Master Gardener Helpline. Um, they might ask you to send disease samples to the uh, disease clinic um, to get them evaluated. Um, but if something seems like it's healthy plant tissue, or you're pulling a lot of weeds at this time of year that don't have a lot of seeds on them, that can all go in the compost pile. That's really great uh, sort of fodder for your compost. Um, but in general, if things are looking diseased, if they have a lot of pest feeding on them, um, it's, it's best to uh, keep those out of a compost pile. You can throw them away in a trash bag, you can bury them deeply, you can put them in the woods uh, behind your house far away from your compost. Um, but those are the, sort of the basics of your veggie debris management at this time of year. Okay, so before we jump into planting the fall garden, Anne, do we have any questions? No, um, nothing, no, not right now. So I'll okay. just, just keep going on. Okay, I will keep going. Okay, um, okay so you've, you've, uh, you've taken some plants out of the garden, you've taken out your stuff that's not producing anymore, the stuff that's giving you a hard time, the stuff that you can't stand to look at anymore because it looks so sad or, or diseased uh, or brown or whatever it is. Um, this is a nice time to plant a fall garden. So there are crops that you can grow now um, and, and be able to harvest throughout the fall season. So we know by now, especially if you've been in some more of these veggie basics classes, that there are crops that really enjoy the hot, sunny weather of, of the middle of the summer in New Jersey, and some that really don't love hot weather, they're, they thrive more on the shoulder seasons of spring and fall. Um, and so you can find planting calendars like this online um, uh, through Rutgers or other extension sites. Um, but that's, that's basically what you need to know. There are warm season crops like tomatoes and beans and corn and cucumbers. And then there are the cooler season crops like beets and carrots and kale that actually uh, don't grow as well when it's really, really hot in the middle of the summer, uh, but they do well uh, when the weather cools down a bit in the fall. So at this time, of the season, uh, we're really looking at semi-hardy crops, which can tolerate a few light frosts. So usually that's temperatures between 36 and 32 degrees, and then hardy crops, which can tolerate hard frosts. These are ones that sometimes you can, you can harvest into the winter time. Um, so down to about 20 degrees. If you use uh, season extension methods, which I'll talk about, sometimes you can harvest throughout the winter. Um, so, so beets, carrots, uh, some lettuces, peas, uh, parsley, those are all good semi-hardy crops that don't mind a little bit of light frost. And then your hardy crops are leeks and kale and cabbage, um, arugula, radishes, those sort of things. Um, so what we're looking for at this time of season, so I mentioned we have only 58 days left of, of our frost freeze season. So you can't really start things that need 100 days to mature unless they're crops that you can harvest when they're immature. So something like chard or kale um, 
they they will grow well in the cool season and you can harvest smaller leaves and those are delicious for salads and things like that. Um, but in general, we want to look for uh, cool season crops that have uh, that mature very quickly at this time of the season. And another thing you want to consider is the fact that as we're going into the fall season, um, our days are getting shorter, uh, we don't have as much sunlight, the temperatures are dropping, and so um, experienced gardeners and extension will recommend that you add on at least seven to 14 days to the, to the days to maturity you find on your seed packet. Uh, that's called the fall factor, and that basically takes into account the fact that fall uh, things are going to be growing a little slower than they would in the in the late spring, for example. So you find your days to maturity or days to harvest on the back of your seed packet. So this radish uh, variety you can harvest in 20 to 30 days, and then you'd add on your fall factor. So for radish, early scarlet globe, uh, it's 20 to 30 days to maturity, so uh, I'll call that 25. I'm going to add on a fall factor of seven days, so that means those radishes will be ready in about 32 days. Um, the fall factor really depends on how mild our fall is. Sometimes we have a really warm fall and sometimes it's freezing, so I'm, you know, I'm thinking maybe this will be a mild fall, so maybe I'll just add on seven days. So in 32 days, if I plant today, I should have um, harvestable radishes. Um, so that means that if we take October 25th as, as kind of the end of our growing season, subtract 32 days, um, that is September 23rd is the last day that you should be planting your radishes. Um, and again, that depends on what kind of season we have. Sometimes you can push that a little bit, but that's a good calculation to be able to do if you're figuring out what you can still plant at this time of the season. So some cold tolerant crops that mature quickly. So we saw radishes, um, beets are, are very quick to mature, uh, spinach, mustard greens, arugula, and lots of types of lettuce. Those are good things that you can start growing right now if you want. Some planting tips. So again, planting in late August, early September is different than planting in the springtime. So the soil is a lot warmer. Um, and so it's going to be uh, kind of hot for things like arugula and lettuce and spinach to germinate because they are cool season crops. So you may need to shade your soil a little bit or cool it down to encourage those crops to germinate. Um, you might want to sow a little bit deeper than what your seed packet says, uh, so a half an inch to an inch um, for small seeded crops, uh, just to shield them from the really hot temperatures. You might consider growing and using transplants because that kind of uh, makes the days to maturity that much faster. So if you can find some transplants at your local farmer's market um, or, or uh, wherever you buy your gardening supplies, um, that could be one way that you can sneak in some late season crops as well. Uh, watering diligently is really important at this time of season because it is hotter and drier than it is in the spring. And you want to have some idea of how you'll protect these crops if we get some surprisingly cold temperatures. Um, I just wanted to include one slide about growing garlic because we are uh, approaching the point uh, at which it is, uh, we're thinking about growing garlic in New Jersey, usually uh, three to eight weeks before frost is a good time to plant garlic. Um, and so that's, that's October for New Jersey, um, probably early October. You can uh, choose either hard neck or soft neck garlic. There are some differences between them. For example, hard neck garlic has scapes and soft neck does not. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a great Rutgers fact sheet on growing garlic. I just wanted to add this in because we usually get a question about garlic, um, but that's another crop that you can think about growing. This is one that you'll, you'll plant uh, in October. It'll put up a little shoot of green um, before the winter comes, and then it will basically go dormant throughout the winter. You mulch it, um, and then it will begin growing again in the spring, and you're able to harvest by late June or early July. So that's a, an overwintering 
crop you could think about adding at this point too. So season extension and frost protection. This is one way to make your fall garden last a little bit longer. There are some different ways you can incorporate this into your garden. Uh, probably one of the most cost effective is to purchase floating row cover, um, which is a kind of a cottony material, um, kind of like a transparent sheet that you can put over your garden beds, either directly onto the beds if you're uh, waiting for things to germinate, or you can create what's called a low tunnel um, and create uh, this little mini greenhouse effect. Um, which I think I have a, yeah, here's a, a close up photo of a low tunnel with the row cover taken off. So these are just uh, PVC pipes um, that sort of arc to make this little greenhouse structure. Um, and then here's your floating, your row cover. It basically acts as a blanket. It will uh, keep some, some, uh, some heat in close to the soil so that things aren't as affected by low temperatures. Um, you can buy these little clips as well, which will clip onto the PVC and kind of keep the row cover uh, in place. Um, and row cover comes in different uh, weights. So you can get the light, the medium or heavy weight row cover, depending on what type, what point in the season you're growing. I think the heavy row cover can protect crops down to like eight or six degrees. So that's, it's a good investment you can use it over and over again it's usually not that expensive some people will build cold frames which again is, is another type of sort of miniature greenhouse you can purchase kits that you can build uh, or you can build them yourself out of found materials um, plexiglass or plastic or if you have old windows that you don't know what to do with you can create a cold frame um, and these can be used in the early spring or late fall. Uh, for some cold tolerant crops, you can even use them to grow in the winter time. So again, it's basically just a box that allows sunlight in and heats up in here so that you're protecting these, uh, these crops from, from the cold. So that's one. Uh, cloches you can use, um, you know, so this person has cut uh, plastic water bottles in half. It's not the nicest look in the garden. Uh, so, you know, you might not want this, but if you have small transplants that you wanna protect, or if you know the weather is gonna get really cold tonight and you just need a last minute uh, protection for these plants, you can just pop, you know, a, a plastic bottle over the top. Um, just to, again, create like a little mini greenhouse for that plant. Okay, so as we get closer to our frost date, um, you might still have some, some tomatoes that you want to harvest. Um, so you can pick green fruits before frost. You, you, sh you shouldn't let them go through a hard frost because the fruit will... Uh, um, not be very good quality on the other side of that. So if you know that we're getting close to that October 25th date, and maybe you've planted your tomatoes late, so they're still fruiting uh, at that point in the season, um, you can pick the green fruits um, and just store them in cool conditions, wrapped in newspaper. Um, some people will actually pull the entire plants and hang them upside down in a garage and they will ripen um, in room temperature. Um, but but it, uh, I, I have never tried that before, but um, it is mentioned in several extension fact sheets. So if you have a lot of tomato fruits still on the vine and you're worried about cold temperatures, you can harvest those and wait for them to, to ripen in room temperature. Uh, and I've just picked a couple of different types of crops and, and how you should handle harvest. Obviously, there are a lot of crops out there and um, harvesting tips. You can go to extension resources or a lot of times seed companies. Um, you know, all the seed companies have these really great websites these days. And I've found that some of my favorite seed companies will have a lot of uh, tips for growing and harvesting right on their website. So, and they're gonna be specific to the variety that you're planting. So that's a good resource as well. Um, potatoes at this time of year uh, and, and later in the season, we're thinking about harvesting potatoes. 
These should be harvested on a dry day when the vines start to die back. Um, or if they are potatoes you're planning to store, you wait two weeks after the vines have died back and that their skins will kind of build up a little bit um, and they will, they'll be a little bit uh, better for storage. Um, dig the tubers up gently with a spading fork, but be careful not to pierce the, the tubers because um, you can allow disease in that way. Um, and then storing in newspaper or straw in cool, moist conditions. So um, unlike the tomatoes that want kind of drier conditions, potatoes like a little bit of moisture. So a damp cellar is a great place to keep potatoes that you've harvested. And then winter squash and pie pumpkins. This is, we're entering the squash and pumpkin time of season. Um, you want to harvest these before you get a hard freeze, so be before temperatures drop below about 30 or 28 degrees. Um, the, the skin of the fruits should feel hard. Um, you'll see that the leaves start dying back and the, the stems start dying back as well. And then some varieties of squash will require um, what's called curing. Um, if, you, if you pick them right off the vine um, and try to eat them, they'll be starchy and, and not very good, kind of like a banana that's that's un, underripe. Um, so they benefit from curing, which basically the, some of the starches in the fruit start to turn to sugars and they become much sweeter. Um, and so you can do this if you have a location indoors that's warm and dry. Uh, just harvest your squash and stick them in that location for 10 to 14 days. Um, when I work worked for a vegetable farm, the farmer would tell their CSA members to put the squash under their bed for uh, two weeks before trying to cook them. Um, so you can put it under your bed. Um, some people will use a greenhouse or something like that, but wherever you have space. Um, and then, uh, you know, just a quick note about what is sometimes called winter sweetening. Um, so you might notice that carrots that you harvest later in the season, um, after we've gotten some cold weather, are a little sweeter. This is a similar process where the starches in the harvestable portion of the, of the crop start to turn into sugars uh, in response to cold weather. And so um, that's good to note, you can actually leave your carrots and beets uh, in the ground uh, if you're getting a couple of light frosts, like we're getting in the, maybe in the mid to low 30s, that will actually make the roots sweeter. Um, if the temperatures go below that, you're going to need to mulch them uh, really heavily to protect the roots from freezing. Um, but winter sweetening also happens with leafy greens like kale, so they'll become a little less bitter uh, when the temperatures uh, get a little lower. So I just wanted to point that out. Okay, so before we dive into fall soil care, which is kind of the last portion of the of the talk, any questions coming in, Anne? Yeah, um, we have one question about uh, garlic. Um, somebody wanted to know good sources for buying garlic. They use Johnny's, but Johnny's is sold out. Mm. Do you know anything about Hudson Valley Seed Co-op co or Ferocious Seeds, or have any other recommendation? Yeah, I think we got this question last year too. Um, you have to, you have to be, uh, you have to order your garlic seed pretty early, is what I have found, um, because a lot of the um, organic garlic seed sources, like Johnny's, they do sell out pretty quickly, and it's almost impossible to find garlic seed at this time of year. Um, so uh, I, I actually don't. Um, I'm sure there are local growers. If Meredith is still on the line, maybe she could chime in with um, people growing or uh, with seed garlic for sale. But um, we can look into that and maybe get back to that person. I, I don't know offhand at this at this point. Okay. And uh, one question is, I guess this is probably for what's uh, coming up is um, this person is concerned about uh, preparing berry fields uh, or beds for winter. So I, I assume that means like strawberries, but I, I don't know. Yeah, um, you know, if, if they are perennial or biennial plants that you're keeping in the ground, I would think uh, mulching is the biggest thing at this point. So um, uh, 
uh, yeah, probably using a good layer of straw mulch. Um, I know that some, I think strawberries, uh, they, they react in a certain way to too much nitrogen. I think they don't set as much fruit. Um, and so you'd want to get a, a soil test as well, which we'll talk about here. Um, but I think mulching and, and getting a soil test so you know what amendments to be adding um, are probably the biggest ones. Um, I guess it yeah it depends on on the type of, of berry that they're trying to grow or if they've had issues in the past with dieback or something like that. But um, that, would be, that yeah. would be my thought. Sorry. <laughs> Final question uh, for this uh, grouping. Um, what is the lowest temperature? I think that's what the question is going for, for beets and carrots. So I tried to find some definitive temperatures for like definitions of light frost and killing frost. Um, it's hard because what I, what I found in my research online is that it depends a lot on how much moisture is in the air. Um, so different crops will react differently depending on also the, how much wind there is apparently. So I can't give a specific um, temperature because it depends on the local conditions a lot. Um, but I, you can continue to harvest carrots into uh, probably low 30s, upper 20s if you mulch. And I do have a slide in here about mulching fall crops, but okay. carrots are, you know, they're a root vegetable, so they are, the harvestable portion is the root of the plant. Um, and as long as they're in the ground and they're not dead, they are taking up water through their root. Um, and so what you're trying to do is make sure that the soil doesn't, the soil water doesn't freeze because then the root cannot take up soil, uh, the water anymore. So adding like four or five inches of mulch to those carrots will help a lot. Um, you can also think about some of the season extension um, uh, that, that we talked about in earlier slides. But I, so I don't, I don't have a specific temperature because it depends on local climatic conditions. Um, but once you get into the low 30s, uh, upper 20s, you wanna make sure you're, you have a lot of mulch on those carrot beds. Okay, thank you. Okay, so fall soil care. So I mentioned that um, uh, uh, that the you know the spring can be very busy. We're thinking about choosing what crops to grow, uh, getting the beds ready, um, getting things planted, and so fall is a nice time to think about uh, ways to care for your soil before the next planting season. Um, I'm going to go through some tips for for salt fall soil care, like getting a soil test. We at Extension, I know we're always telling you guys to get soil tests all the time, but they really are some, that's some of the most helpful information about your garden that you can have. Um, you wanna keep your soil covered throughout the winter time. We do get a lot of rain in the fall typically, and so you don't wanna be dealing with lots of runoff that can be damaging to the soil. So keeping it covered if possible. Um, consider planting a fall cover crop and minimizing your soil disturbance when it's wet. So um, trying to stay out of the garden bed when uh, it's right after the, the, it has just rained because um, working the soil when it's wet can, can do a number on the soil structure. So soil testing, um, if you've been to our talks before, you kind of know the deal. Uh, you can go to the Rutgers Soil Testing Lab. If you are a New Jersey resident, um, there is one at Penn State as well. If you're a Pennsylvania resident, um, they will give you information about how to sample your soil, um, how to send it into the lab, um, and how to interpret the results. And this is something that Master Gardeners can help you with um, and your, your local extension office. So I, I would recommend doing that now. That's gonna give you an idea of your soil pH and your uh, nutrients in your soil so that you know uh, what you might have to add either now or in the springtime to get ready to plant next year. Um, so this is really valuable information. It's gonna uh, guide a lot of what happens in your garden for the next uh, year or a couple of years, so um, this is a good time to do that. Also, the soil testing lab gets very, very busy in the spring, uh, and so you're, you're more likely to hear back from them faster if you get a soil test now. Uh, so keeping the bare so uh, soil covered, 
uh, so I've, we talked about pulling out a lot of plants. Um, so you're going to be making space in the garden and you're, you're probably going to have some more bare soil as you remove plants and you harvest things. Um, try to keep the soil covered, especially throughout the winter. Um, we recommend using some type of organic mulch and just three to six inches of mulch um, to bare beds. Um, and if you're growing fall crops, again, those roots need to be protected uh, from freezing. So, so that will help keep some heat in as well. We have access to some great mulching materials at this time of year, uh, shredded leaves. So don't put your leaves out on the curb. Those are a really great uh, resource for your garden in the fall and for your compost pile. So any leaves that are falling from your trees, you can mulch right back into the lawn or collect them and use them as mulch in your garden. Lawn clippings that are pesticide free um, and you can purchase clean straw as well. Um, so most people in New Jersey grow cool season grasses for their lawns, which means uh, they do most of their growing in the, the spring and the fall. So in the fall, we're going to have this, you know, big flush of growth in your lawn as we start to get uh, the temperatures go down and we start to get um, some more rain. So this is a good time to collect grass clippings because they make really great mulch. And you could add some to your compost pile as well. Um, so just a, a reminder about that resource for your garden. And we talked about this already, but make sure that you're mulching any fall crops that you have. So these crops, even though their growth is slowing down, if they're still in the ground and they're still alive, they are still growing. Um, if, you know, it, albeit kind of slowly. So you want to mulch around them. Um, heavy, you know, mulch heavier at the colder it gets because you're trying to protect those roots below the soil surface from, from freezing and that soil water from freezing. So you can harvest longer the more, uh, the more bedding and, and mulch that you give these crops. And then you might consider establishing fall cover crops, especially if you've got a larger garden. So we usually uh, see cover crops being used by farmers or maybe market gardeners who have a lot of space, um, but they can be a good tool for home gardeners as well. So cover crops are plants that you grow in the garden with the express purpose of, of um, helping out your soil. Uh, so they're not crops that you're going to be harvesting, you're, you're going to, they're either going to die on the soil surface, or you're going to be incorporating them or tilling them back into the soil to improve your soil structure and your organic matter. So this is a nice time to think about fall cover crops. And when we're talking about fall cover crops, we're thinking about grasses, legumes, and roots. So grasses like annual ryegrass or oats, um, grasses are really good at building organic matter in the soil. They usually have uh, these nice uh, extensive um, fibrous root systems, so they're creating a lot of biomass, um, and they're also scavenging nutrients. So their roots are going deep down in the soil. Um, they're taking up nutrients that weren't used by your vegetable crops, um, and, and so those nutrients won't be lost to your garden system. They're going to be taken up by these plants. Um, so grasses are good. Annual ryegrass and oats will, uh, oats definitely will reliably winter kill in New Jersey. Um, the, some people will use uh, uh, grasses that will overwinter, like winter rye, for example. Um, and those can turn a little weedy in the garden because they can be a little harder to kill. Um, so using annual species uh, is a nice way to make sure that these plants aren't going to become weeds in your garden, basically. Um, legumes, so plants in the pea uh, and clover family are good at adding nitrogen to the soil. Um, so legume species have uh, this neat symbiotic relationship with soil bacteria that help the plants um, basically deliver nitrogen from the air into the plant tissue. So if your, your soil is um, low in organic matter or low in nitrogen, uh, you may consider growing something like field peas or crimson clover. And these will also winter kill. As, as soon as temperatures get low, they will die on the soil surface. 
Uh, and then roots, you can, you can imagine what roots do. So if you have really compact soil, maybe you have a lot of clay, you might consider growing something that has a really large tap root, which will kind of break through some of that compaction. Um, tillage radish is usually used more by farmers than gardeners, but just to demonstrate, um, you know, a tillage radish is, is going to die back as soon as we get a killing frost. Uh, and then once this root uh, decomposes, it's going to leave this nice channel in the soil for water and air to get through. So if you've got really compacted soil, think about planting something that has a nice tap root. And then there are cover crop cocktails. So these are mixtures of different types of cover crops that you can plant together. So for example, you can put field pea and oats in the same bed and they grow nicely together. In general, you want to sow cover crops by September 15th in New Jersey, in this area. Um, we want to have enough of the growing season left that the plants will germinate and put on some growth before the winter comes. Um, the seeding rate is going to be based on the cover crop type and variety. And you want to incorporate these plants at least two weeks before you plant in the spring. And when I say incorporate, I mean basically taking a shovel and digging them back into the soil. Um, so if you're planning to plant things in the spring, just make sure that you, you do that, you till in your cover crops about two weeks before you plan to plant. So that plant material has some time to break down. And then you can use a, a resource like this one from the University of Wisconsin Extension, which will show you all sorts of cover crops you can use and the seeding rate, um, the growth rate, and some, you know, some helpful comments as well. This is also a good time if you're thinking of expanding your vegetable garden. Maybe you want to take over part of your lawn uh, next season and use it to plant vegetables. This is a good time to think about creating new garden beds. You can do this in the spring too, but uh, we're kind of poised, we're in a good position right now to start uh, to get kind of a head start on this. So one way you can do this, and probably the way that takes the least amount of digging and effort, um, manual labor is uh, either sheet mulching or that's sometimes called lasagna mulching. And where you would choose an area, say of your lawn, um, and you basically add layers of uh, of wood chips, newspaper, cardboard, compost, grass clippings, uh, this really nice mixture of organic materials that will break down throughout the winter and spring and leave you with a nice uh, garden bed. So first you'd want to remove any perennial weeds that you have in that area, um, loosen up the soil with a, with a garden fork, and then put four to six layers of wet newspaper or cardboard on the base. Then on top of that, you put manure or grass clippings or something else that's high in nitrogen, maybe some leaves that you've raked up from a big tree on your property. Um, and then you go, you alternate layers. So you have your high nitrogen materials like grass clippings and leaves, followed by your high carbon materials like newspaper, cardboard. And you, you continue to layer um, until it's about 18 inches or 24 inches high. And you leave that throughout the season. Um, you can cover it with burlap if you're concerned with how it looks or if the material is kind of flying out. You might also have to use a hose to sort of wet the material so it stays put. Um, but basically by the end of the season, uh, you will have created this nice organic rich uh, vegetable or garden bed. Um, this can be used if you want to extend your perennial beds or flower beds or anything. So this is a, a good time of season to be thinking ahead to next year about it, whether you want to expand or create new beds. Um, composting, we haven't really talked about. This is a whole other uh, topic, but if you have compost piles going and you've got some mature uh, compost that's finished, um, you, this is a nice time to harvest that compost out of the bin and distribute it throughout the garden um, to get a little head start uh, for next season as well. So um, usually an inch to maybe two inches of compost on all of your vegetable beds is a nice way to add some 
uh, some really nice, rich, organic material to those beds. End of season sanitation. So this is also a good time to sanitize any pots and trays that you've used for seed starting. Um, all of your tools should be cleaned. Uh, you can sterilize pots, trays, and tools with a solution of bleach and water. Um, and this is important so you're not carrying over pathogens uh, from one season to the next. So just in case you did have some transplants that had disease on them, and this is a nice way to ensure that uh, you are, you're not uh, carrying those over to the next season. Um, so uh, this is important. Also, just brushing off uh, soil from your tools, uh, making sure everything is, is uh, you, you can repair some things. Winter is a great time for caring for your garden tools so that by the time spring comes, you are ready to hit the ground running. Uh, and then maybe the most fun part of the winter has to be, you know, you order your seed catalogs and you start thinking and dreaming about the next growing season. So review the record that you made from this vegetable growing season. What worked? What didn't work? Um, you know, what varieties would you maybe like to try next time? So you can, you can order free seed catalogs from most seed companies. Sometimes, again, they'll have a really nice website that uh, will have a lot of great information and get you excited for the next growing season. So that's my final slide. I have put my email address here. Um, if you have gardening questions about and you're a New Jersey grower, I would recommend reaching out to your local master gardener helpline. So if you're in Mercer County, uh, as Meredith mentioned, the Mercer County master gardeners are are uh, standing by for your questions. If you've got a question about something I went over today, feel free to shoot me an email as well. So um, thank you, thanks so much. And I'd be happy to answer some questions if we've got any. We, we do. Um, the number of questions related to basically the soil preparation. Um, <clears throat> somebody followed up about the soil test and wanted to know, how often are they, should they be doing this? They test it in the spring. Do they need to do another test this fall? Um, so probably not. So we, we recommend at least once every three years uh, or if you are encountering issues in the garden. So, so if your initial soil test revealed that you have a pH of 7.8 or something that's really high um, and you've, you've you know, you've added some soil amendments to try to remedy that, you may want to get your soil tested again in the fall to see, you know, how much your pH has been adjusted. Uh, or if you're seeing, you know, your, your, the leaves on a lot of your plants are getting yellow or things are dying, um, you might want to soil test more often. But in general, between one, every, every year and every three years is generally okay. Okay, so um, here's a person who doesn't want to use uh, cover crops, but says, if I put straw down as a cover, will that add too much nitrogen to the soil? And also in the spring, do I remove that straw or do I till it into the soil? So straw is actually gonna add more carbon than nitrogen to the soil. So, um, what I would be concerned about is not adding too much nitrogen, but every time you add a carbon rich material to your soil, um, you, you might be tying up nitrogen in the soil because the microbes uh, are trying to break down that straw, which has a lot of carbon in it. And in order to do that, they have to use nitrogen from the soil. So if, if your soil doesn't have a lot of nitrogen in it, or that's been an issue for you, you might not want to use a lot of straw, um, maybe grass clippings or, or uh, leaves might be better. Um, and then in terms of whether to uh, till it into the soil in the spring, um, I, I would say it depends on what kind, of, um, uh, what kind of layer you're dealing with. So if it's just maybe an inch of straw, yes, I would, I would till that right into the soil. It's probably uh, nice and decayed and, and partially broken down by the springtime after the winter. 
But if you, for example, you were growing carrots really late into the season and you've got this like six to eight inch layer of straw mulch, um, I would probably remove that and put it in the compost pile or, or put it in another part of your garden. Because again, that much carbon uh, going into the soil in the spring, you're going to have some, some nitrogen issues um, later. So uh, it's a little complicated. I, you know, there's lots of fact sheets that describe how that happens and, and why, you know, why that happens, but. Um, um, probably the last question uh, is um, if you have late fall crops, can you still plant cover crops? Wouldn't they conflict with each other? Yeah, so it's probably best to plant cover crops in beds where you do not have any late fall crops growing. So, um, you know, if you have a bed full of squash or something, or it, something, not maybe not squash, something that you're, you're wrapped up with the season for that crop by mid-September, um, it's too late at that point to uh, plant a, uh, to uh, plant a fall crop, but you can get some cover crops in there. Um, I would dedicate that entire bed to cover crops. Um, you know, I think some farmers do manage to plant uh, like living mulches and cover crops within the rows of their their growing crops, and there can be some competition there. Um, but for the home gardener, especially since space is usually limited, I would dedicate certain beds to cover crops and certain beds to your fall crops. And then maybe next season, switch that around. So next year, the bed that didn't get the cover crops now gets the cover crops. And so I think that's how I would manage that situation. Okay, well, I just wanted to mention too that um... We are, we are going to be having a compost program in uh, the end of September, September 25th, which I mentioned before. So people who have questions, especially um, we're gonna be talking about the different kinds of bins and things like that, that uh, people can, uh, you know, come out to our, our, our Mercer Educational Gardens and look at the compost demonstration site and see what um, they might wanna try using. But, at any rate, um, lots of things to think about, and it was uh, wonderful to see you, Margaret. And thank you so much for sharing your knowledge, and we hope to have you back for other uh, things that uh, maybe some something about cut flowers would be fun, wouldn't it? Yes. <laughs> I would love that. I'd love to come back anytime, Anne. Okay, that's terrific. So I think that's it for the day, and um, thanks to everybody for coming and have a wonderful weekend. We're getting rain, so <laughs> I guess that's good. <laughs> Great. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.